Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in. And now I wish to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, still talking about the supposed temporal power of the Pope, the kingly power of the Pope, and how it was uh, acquired, since it was, no, didn't, it was not divinely uh, instituted by Christ upon the Pope of Rome, how did it come about? Uh, now, to begin with this morning, we'll, we'll uh, begin at, the, at the, uh, the start of the paragraph in which we were reading at the very end. For continuity purposes, you'll find it on page 260 at about the middle of the page. And we'll begin. It says, It is of no consequence to inquire here how long the supernatural power conferred upon the apostles continued to be possessed by their successors in the work of spreading the gospel, whether it ceased with those who came directly in contact with them or with John, the last survivor. For if at the beginning the power was equally possessed by all the apostles and not by Peter alone, to the exclusion of others, it would be absurd and illogical to say that it survived to a single church alone or to the bishop of a single church. That would bring about unity not founded upon Christ, but upon the supernatural power of one apostle not a unity of affection, but of compulsion. For none but those who argue falsely will insist that the apostles changed their relationships to each other after the crucifixion, or that they designed that the churches they established upon principles of equality should have that equality either destroyed or disturbed. It is sufficient to know now that even the Pope with, infallibly to, with infallibility to aid him, has no supernatural power, that he cannot set aside a single law of nature or perform any other miraculous act. However, uh, excuse me, whatever supposed miracles are now attracting the notice and, and excitation of the devotion of the faithful are attributed to the Mother of God and not to the Pope. So the Pope is no miraculous character like the apostles were. And so how can he arrogate to himself the attributes of the apostles? Which he does. And under that, that assumption, under that proposition, he asserts his divine right to be a king of the world. Now it says, and therefore upon the hypothesis of Archbishop Kenrick, remember this is our, a Roman Catholic Archbishop that's bringing these facts to bear. It says, and therefore upon the hypothesis of Archbishop Kenrick, if all the right which the papacy has to interfere with temporals arose out of the spiritual power conferred on Peter, and if the Pope now possesses no supernatural power, Peter is left without a successor in the temporal order. Sounds logical, doesn't it? And that is the end of the controversy until that power shall be reconferred. That the world will be better off without conceding it to the Pope is abundantly proven by the fact that the freer the modern nations have been from the papal influences the more rapidly have they progressed, and still more clearly by the additional fact that since the load of papal oppression has been removed from the states of the church, we're talking about the papal states, Rome is beginning to assume a dignity and importance which she has not known for centuries. So the author acknowledges the improvements in the papal states once the temporal sword of the Pope was removed, that sword of oppression, Rome was beginning to thrive without the weight, the presumed weight of the Pope, 
over them. It says, the frank admissions of Archbishop Kenrick in relation to the destitute condition of the Apostle Peter and his entire want of dominion leave those who defend the divine foundation of the temporal power without anything to rest their theory on. They will not pretend that anything done by Christ was improperly done. The church would pronounce them heretics if they were not ready to concede that the Christianity he established and the church he founded by apostolic agency were necessarily possessed of the utmost perfection. If, then, Christ established a perfect system of Christianity and founded a perfect church and sent forth Peter and the other apostles without scrip or staff, with no dominion over any part of the earth, and without wealth or any of the appendages of royalty, to extend the influence of religion and enlarge the borders of the church, it is, not, is it not an impeachment of the divine plan to say, as they do, that the temporal power and the large wealth and the appendages of royalty are necessary to the propagation of the gospel? The apostles, without any power or dominion, did the work of the Master well and faithfully, and sought after neither at the hands of the government or individuals. But when those who ought to have followed their footsteps turned away after temporal dominion, they set up their wisdom above that of God. They substituted their pride for the apostolic humility and checked the progress of Christianity by blocking up the avenues to religious truth and to the highways of the world's advancement. Demonstration of this is found in a long array of facts connected with the origin and growth of the temporal power of the Pope. History abundantly proves that this power has been employed by ambitious popes for their own personal advancement, and that it has been so unblushingly used in violation of the teachings of Christ and his apostles that many of, many of them have made it equal, if not more heretical, to deny its existence as to deny the divinity of the Savior. Peter lived all his life without dominion, and at his death, says Archbishop Kenrick, quote, bequeathed to his successors no inheritance but the labors and dangers of his office, unquote. And yet the present Pope is convulsing the world with intense excitement by continually asserting that Christ conferred temporal dominion and royal authority on Peter, that he, as Peter's successor, is entitled to the same dominion by inheritance, and that those who have taken it away as well as those who deny the legitimacy of his claim, have sinned against heaven and are accursed of God. Why should he mourn so sadly and his supporters grieve so much at the loss of that which, as Archbishop Kenry clearly shows, has been added by others since the death of Peter? Has Christianity so changed since then that it needs the aid of external force and temporal power to sustain it? But notwithstanding these admissions, so candidly and frankly made by Archbishop Kenrick, he falls at last into the same course of reasoning so common among the supporters of the papacy, finds in the circumstances according to him enough to satisfy his own mind, that when the popes did come into possession of their temporal power, it was legitimately obtained and without any usurpation. Yet he has not and could not tell the time of this important event. He readily concedes that the document so frequently referred to by the Jesuits as the donation of Constantine is supposititious, in other words, just suppose, conjecture, okay? Yet concludes with de Meister that notwithstanding this, Constantine did make a donation of some kind, the nature and extent of which, however, he does not attempt to explain, for the manifest reason that he could not. 
the most that can be the the most that he can say of it is of it this donation of Constantine is based upon the authority of the infidel Voltaire who said that the church of St John that's St John Lateran in Rome was present with a was was quote uh, presented with a large revenue of lands in Cambria and that other emperors subsequent to Constantine increased this patrimony. But Voltaire expressly says that this was not given to the Pope, but was a mere donation of property to the church, to a particular church in Rome, and it could not, therefore, have been any part of the papal patrimony out of which it was possible for the temporal power to have arisen. It is undoubtedly true that the Pope, as head of the church in Rome, did have a certain amount of authority necessary to enable him to see that the property of the church there and of those within that jurisdiction was properly taken care of and managed. In the aggregate, this property was even then more considerable and yielded a large revenue. Archbishop Kenrick says, upon the authority of Fleury, another historian, Roman Catholic historian, that it included, quote, some houses and farms, not only in Italy, but likewise in Sicily, Africa, and Greece, unquote. But this authority could not have been anything more than what was necessary to protect the use and enjoyment of this estate. The mere authority of ownership under the civil law just as it is now secured to all the churches in the United States. The wealth yielded by it was attended with influence, but not necessarily such as pertains to the temporal power claimed by the popes. It was doubtless such such as large possessions have produced in every age, for in this respect it is not probable that society has ever undergone much change. The power acquired by the possession of property is of a very different kind than that involved in the government uh, uh, and the management of public affairs. Archbishop Kenrick thinks that in the case of the popes, it was such that after Constantine removed the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, quote, the bishop of Rome was left in a position almost independent the pontifical chair being no longer overshadowed by the imperial throne, unquote. In proof of this, he does not cite any grant or concession to the Pope, but merely a reply of Pope Leo the Great to the Emperor Marcion when he excused himself from attending a general council on the grounds that his absence from Rome would endanger the public peace, stating that, temporal necessity does not allow me to leave Rome, unquote. But the learned archbishop strangely overlooked several important facts, which fairly interpreted do not support his conclusions. In the first place, we have seen that Constantine never resided at Rome, and therefore the removal of the capital to Constantinople could not have made the pontifical chair any the less overshadowed than it had been before. In the second place, we've also seen that when Constantine conquered Rome from Maxentius, he made no change in the government. Nor did he make any when he removed the capital other than to divide the empire into four parts, leaving Rome under the government of prefects, who represented the the imperial power. This temporal power was not shared by the popes during his life. In the third place, we have also seen upon the authority of Eusebius that he, had been bec- that he had become dissatisfied with the bishops and clergy on account of disgraceful qu- quarrels and had been, by imperial edict, confined them to their proper law, that is, to their ecclesiastical functions, a fact which forbids the idea that he conferred temporal power upon the pope when he knew that thereby he would be violating his own edict. In the fourth place, he he became, in the end, so greatly dissatisfied 
with the Orthodox clergy that he never united by baptism with the Roman Catholic Church, but banished many Catholic bishops. And still further, 100 years had elapsed from the death of Constantine to the beginning of the pontificate of Leo the Great, during which time so many changes had occurred in the empire under the government of more than a dozen emperors that the condition of affairs created by Constantine could not properly uh, could not be properly inferred from anything said by Leo to Marcion. The intervening years were too numerous and the multitude of events too varied. But a true understanding of the pontificate of Leo I will show that although he made extraordinary and almost superhuman efforts to grasp power, which did not properly belong to the papacy, for the purpose of bringing all the other churches into obedience to that of Rome, yet that what he did in that direction was based exclusively upon his claim of spiritual supremacy and not upon his possession of temporal power, either as conferred by grant from the empire or as included in the spiritual. Any such claim as the latter, then asserted by him, would have brought him in open collision with the emperor, a result which, ambitious as he was, he was extremely and studiously anxious to avoid. Yet at the same time, it is not to be disputed that Leo went as far as he dared to attach temporal supremacy to the spiritual patrimony of Peter. And if he failed, it was owing more to the firmness with which the Emperor Marcion retained possession of the imperial power than to the want of the skill, tact, and ambition on the part of the Pope for the acknowledged possession of all which qualifies uh, of, of all which qualities he has been placed upon the calendar of Roman saints and was won the title of great. He complained that the patriarch of Constantinople had asserted rights as belonging to that see, which he insisted did not exist, and in a letter to Marcion begged him to, quote, to make use of his authority to keep the patriarch in order and hinder him from encroaching upon the rights of other bishops, unquote, which exclusively proves that even in reference to such spiritual jurisdictions as involved the obedience of other churches and bishops, he recognized himself as dependent on the emperor. When he wrote to the bishops, he assumed an, an imperial air and expressed himself in words of imperial authority. But when he addressed the emperor, he exhibited the deference of inferiority. The first council of Nice in the year 325 had fixed the time of the celebration of Easter, making it a matter of religious faith. Yet Pope Leo I, more than a hundred years after, finding a controversy upon the subject still going on among Christians, wrote to the emperor Marcion beseeching him to quote, to quote-unquote command that steps be taken to bring about uniformity. He also wrote to the empress, exhorting her to use her authority to bring some monks, uh, some monks into sub, in, uh, to submit to the Council of Chalcedon, which was held during his pontificate and was one of the ecumenical councils. So does that sound like a, a pope that has any temporal power to even beseech the mistress of the throne? <laughs> Not only is he is he putting himself at the beck and call of of the of the emperor, but his spouse. And it said he had no power to restore Juvenal, bishop of Jerusalem, to his see after he had been expelled and when it was done by the emperor, thanked him for it. When disturbances existed in the church of Alexandria, and both the contesting parties had addressed him on the subject, not having authority to quiet them, he appealed to the emperor Leo to do so, and not to suffer heretics to trust themselves into the government of the church. He also solicited the same emperor to send Orthodox bishops to Alexandria and to restore the bishop of Egypt, 
who had been driven out by the heretics. When the emperor of his own accord removed a heretical bishop of the See of Alexandria, Pope Leo congratulated him upon the act and requested the appointment of another Orthodox bishop in his place. Can there be any room to doubt in the light of these facts gathered from the work of a distinguished Roman Catholic historian about the relations existing between the emperors Marcion and Leo and Pope Leo I? Did this, uh, that this condition was one of dependence is left beyond controversy, and dependence, too, to such an extent as precludes all possibility of his having possessed any temporal power over the affairs of Rome or any other part of the empire or any authority even in spiritual matters beyond the local jurisdiction of the Church of Rome, and that only in the same sense as to the same extent as was possessed by other bishops in the local jurisdiction of their several churches. So history reveals that at best, and I say this too is an excess, that at best the Bishop of Rome had spiritual authority only and only over the church at Rome. And I even deny him that. That Pope Leo I was a great man and a great pope, nobody ought to question, says the author. He was so immeasurably above other popes immediately before and after him that he is entitled to a prominent place in history. That he was also ambitious is an accepted fact. But we should keep in mind the difference between the ambition to govern the world and the power to do it. The one is a sentiment, the other a fact. He undoubtedly claimed that as the successor of Peter at Rome, he was endowed with divine authority to govern all the churches of the world in spiritual things, because the Roman Catholic Church was the only one founded on Peter, and therefore was the quote-unquote mother and mistress of them all. And anybody who's familiar with their Bible knows who that mother and mistress is and where it is spoken of in God's Word. And it clearly describes it as a whore. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church is, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy particularly Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Rome, the Roman church, prophetically identifies herself as a mother and a mistress, claiming that title as her just authority over all the other so-called Christian churches in the world. And I maintain that those churches in this world called Christian who submit to Rome's authority, have committed fornication against their Lord and Savior, and have slept in a foreign bed, and they ought to repent. And that means getting out of this ecumenical uh, movement and exposing it for what it is. It's spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery, leaving Christ and sleeping with the whore of Rome is not, not any good way for a Christian church to act. And repentance is due, and the sooner the better. Speaking of Pope Leo I, the canonized pope of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, known as Pope Leo the Great, one of the greatest popes according to Roman Catholic history, he undoubtedly claimed that as successor of Peter at Rome, he was endowed with divine authority to govern all the churches of the world in spiritual things because the Roman church was the only one founded on Peter and therefore was the mother and mistress of them all. Do you suppose that's why in Revelation chapter 17... The apostate, ecumenical, evangelical belly churches who are now in bed with Rome in this ecumenical movement are 
designated her daughter, her daughters, harlot daughters. They've conceded that they left Mama, and they made a mistake, and now they wish to come home. Mother and daughter relationships. Before the break, I said uh, that I don't concede even the fact, as asserted by Rome, that Pope, that Pope Leo I was the legitimate spiritual authority of the Church at Rome. I will make this clarification. He may have been the spiritual leader of the Church at Rome, but the Church at Rome was not that Church established by Paul in Rome. That the Church of Rome has been apostate since its very beginning. Christ was never the center of that Church, it was not started by Paul. It was started by Simon Magus, as we alluded to yesterday on the program. God's true church was persecuted and nearly wiped out. And most of them fled Rome. And those who remained in Rome simply stayed in the shadows, met in catacombs, met in private circles, met in private houses, it was a persecuted church, just like God's church has always been persecuted. This big, boisterous, pompous, blasphemous, fancy, gold-plated church in Rome was not the persecuted church. It was the persecuting church. Now, I'll continue. Speaking of Pope Leo I and this Mother of mother and mistress of all the churches. <clears throat> it says, and that he would have stretched this authority so far as to have included temporals, but for the decisive stand taken by the emperors is equally undoubted. For he went so far as to foreshadow the extraordinary pretensions which other popes attempted to justify several centuries afterward by the authority of the false decretals, the false decretals, and you've heard me talk about them before, another title given to these false decretals are the pseudo-Isidorian decretals. And we'll talk about them extensively during the reading of this book. These false decretals, which as well as understood, were forged for the express purpose of supporting the temporal power of the Pope. So starting from the beginning, we have this so-called donation of Constantine, which is absolutely baseless, understood even by Roman Catholic historians to be a pretentious farce, a fabrication, a lie, to justify the temporal power of the Pope, to give it basis, and it has none. It's understood by the most devout Roman Catholics and also to go along with it, to compound this error, were produced the false decretals. Also, a, a forgeries, just like the donation of Constantine, and all of it for the advancement of the theory, the false theory, the lying theory called the temporal power of the Pope, or the patrimony of Peter, as it's sometimes called. Now, continuing, he said he brought the uh, excuse me he brought the bishops and clergy so submissively at his feet that upon the reading of one of his letters to the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, the members exclaimed, quote, "Accursed be he that admits not that Peter has spoken by the mouth of Leo." Unquote. He was the first quote. Excuse me. He was the first pope whose eloquent preaching stirred the people of Rome. And in the ecclesiastical world, he reached a far higher degree of distinction than any of his predecessors. And if investigating the question of his temporal power, we were to confine ourselves to his claim and acts of spiritual supremacy alone, we might readily fall into the error of supposing that he was really a temporal prince. Whereas the truth is that he was not so in any proper sense, though one can well imagine that as, that as by far the greatest man in Rome, 
he must have been deferred to by the Roman people in all matters concerning the peace and welfare of the city, and more especially so as he was a native of Rome and immediately and personally identified with its fortunes. Thus, when Attila marched his army upon the city and the whole population was thrown into consternation for fear he would ravage it, as he had done Pavia and Milan, the Senate was assembled to consider what measures of defense should be adopted. It was decided to send, quote, an honorary embassy to Attila, unquote, with the view of obtaining pacific terms, in other words, to pacify him. And by common consent, it was agreed that Pope Leo should be at the head of it, not merely because he was Pope, but on account of his eminent ability. He occupied no such relation to the temporal affairs of the city as made him their special guardian or protector. But at the solicitation of the imperial authority and the Senate, accepted the position and went out to meet the terrible prince who had acquired the reputation of being, quote, the scourge of God, unquote, and the, quote, enemy of mankind, unquote. He did not go as a temporal ruler, but at the solicitation of the civil authorities representing the empire in whose hands all the temporal power was lodged. He went as an ambassador, attended by Av Av Avienus and Trigetius, two of the most, uh, two of the greatest men of the empire, and several senators. At the point where the Mincio discharges itself into the Po near Mantua, an audience was granted to the assembly by Attila, which resulted in the withdrawal of his army beyond the Danube and the safety of the city. It is represented by the papal writers upon the authority of Baronius, who borrowed it from, quote, a writer of the 8th century, unquote, that this result was brought about because, quote, Attila saw two venerable personages, supposed to be the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul, standing on the side of the Pope while he spoke, as it were, as if it were produced by the special interposition of providence. But this story is scarcely worthy of credit because of the fact, if no other, that Attila was utterly insensible to all such influences and appearances. It was undoubtedly owing to the irresistible eloquence of Pope Leo, to whom, on his account and beyond all question, belong all the honor and glory of the achievement. History records no more magnificent triumph, none which exhibit higher personal qualities on the part of the chief actor. The speech of Leo, says Mainborg, Quote, was so fine and judicious, so forcible and moving, that Attila was immediately softened, and from having been a ravening wolf as he was before, he became gentle as a lamb and immediately granted him the peace he desired. Unquote. There was nothing supernatural about this, no indication of any direct providential interference through the agency of Peter's successor. And the additional story of an old man with a, with a drawn sword having been seen by Attila in a vision and his having been terrified by his threats is still more unworthy of belief. Leo's reputation needs no such fictitious aid, no such monkish inventions, and is, rather impair, and, and, and is rather impaired than benefited by this and the foolish tale of his having cut off his hand and his miraculous restoration in answer to his prayers. Yet great as this triumph over Attila was, there is satisfactory proof that there was nothing supernatural about it in the fact that he was unable to achieve a like one over Genseric when he afterward advanced upon Rome. Although his influence was then sufficient to cause three of the principal search, uh, churches, including that of St. Peter, to be exempted from the general pillage, yet the city was otherwise subjected to terrible devasta devastation. Everything that he did on both these occasions was consistent with distinguished citizenship merely. 
and was most appropriately performed by him as personally the greatest living bishop, greater by far than any emperor who occupied the throne during his pontificate. But high and distinguishing as were the qualities which rendered Pope Leo I the most conspicuous man of his age, there's another aspect in which his character is to be viewed, which, while it exhibits his thorough devotion to the papacy, leaves a blot upon his reputation which no adulation can gloss over. And it proves also that the temporal power at Rome was not lodged in his hands, but in those of the emperor, behind whom, in this particular instance, it is found very convenient to shelter him from that just measure of indignation which is merited by his persecuting and vindictive spirit. An old law of the empire, enacted to please former persecuting popes, provided for punishing heretics with death but it had remained for a long time unexecuted, as the other emperors, initiating the example of Constantine, had been content to banish them merely. Priscillian, however, was put to death for heresy under this law, during the pontificate of Leo the Great, and he especially approved of and justified the bloody deed and all its accompanying horrors. The venerable Gnostic, that is, uh, Priscillian was imprisoned, bound with cords and chains by the cruel and heartless monks who were the mere tools and mercenaries of the Pope. They, quote, made his limbs crack under the pressure of his chains and plunged both his feet into a heated brazier, unquote. They, quote, tore them, they both tore from, his, uh, from him his hair and the skin of his skull, they burned with hot iron all parts of his body and poured upon his wounds boiling oil and melted lead and at last plunged into his entrails a hot heated, uh, a, a rod heated in the fire, unquote, from which, of course, after the most intense and excruciating agony, he expired. Although it is pretended that no pope ever directly sanctioned the shedding of blood on account of heresy, and the supporters of the papacy always throw the censure of such cruelty upon the secular authorities, yet Pope Leo I did approve and justify this horrid deed, and then endeavored to escape the consequences by charging it to the laws of the empire, which, if he had been a temporal prince in Rome, as he asserts, he could have executed and suspended at his pleasure. For this act of approval, he must stand at the bar of the 19th century, equally culpable as the civil authorities of the empire, and more so for the detestable sentiments in which it was expressed. But the fact that Priscillian was executed by the civil authorities settles beyond all controversy that Leo I the Great and all-powerful as he was in spiritual affairs, did not possess any temporal power, even in Rome. And Archbishop Kenrick honestly concedes this when he says, quote, Although the Bishop of Rome was not yet a temporal prince, yet his spiritual power was surrounded with so great secular influence that he almost ranked as a prince, unquote manifestly because, his, uh, because of his high personal qualities, his great eloquence, and the energy of his will, not by divine providence, I will just add. Yet the archbishop, immediately after making these concessions, would have it to be implied that the pope did possess some temporal power, by the statement of the fact that in the year 484, Pope Felix II, quote, complained to the Emperor Zeno that the laws of nations had been violated by the injurious treatment of his legates, unquote. But this proves nothing to the purpose. It had long been the custom of the Christian nations to receive the legates of the Pope and to treat them with that dis degree of respect to which the Roman Church was entitled so long as their mission were confined to spiritual matters. 
but none of them had yet been so reduced to obedience as to submit without murmur to the direct interference of the Pope, either by legates or otherwise, with their secular affairs. Even in Spain, which was more under the influence of the Pope than any other nation, his authority was, restri was restricted to matters concerning the Church. The relations between the Emperor Zeno and Pope Felix II were those of sovereign and subject. During the pontificate of Simplicius, immediately preceding that of Felix, Zeno became emperor upon the death of Emperor Leo. But a revolt was stirring up against him by, Basilic by Basilicus, who succeeded in driving him from the throne and taking possession of it. He expelled the Orthodox and put heterodox prelates in their places, in which he was resisted by the Patriarch of Constantinople. Pope Simplicius approved the course of the Patriarch at first, but afterward, with the, Pope of, uh, with the hope of excluding Timotheus from the See of Alexandria on account of the rivalry between them, he advised him to resist Zeno, the legitimate emperor, and support the cause of Basilicus, the, the heretical usurper, the heretical usurper thus giving his official support to heresy and his sanction to an act of open revolt against the throne. The patriarch followed his advice to the extent of making war upon the supporters of Timotheus, and the empire was thrown into, into such commotion that Zeno was, ena was enabled with his army to retake possession of the throne by the expulsion of Basilicus. This embarrassed the Pope for a time, but with true papal adroitness, he endeavored to restore himself to the good opinion of Zeno by taking his side. He had no conscientious scruples about changing from one side to the other, provided he always found himself in concert with the strongest party. Zeno was not at all averse to the reconciliation because in the confused and unsettled condition of affairs, he needed the assistance of the Pope to keep the empire in his hands. And an incident soon transpired showing that the Pope did not intend to forfeit the protection of the emperor by any act invading the imperial jurisdiction. Each was playing the part of a skillful politician, power, and nothing else being the stake they played for. Upon the death of Timotheus, the, the priest of Alexandria elected his successor without consulting either the emperor or the pope, the latter at that time as bishop of Rome having no recognized jurisdiction over the church of Alexandria. Zeno, incensed at this election, expelled the new bishop from his see, who in revenge appealed to Pope Simplicius, hoping to obtain his intervention in his favor. Probably the Pope, in order to increase his own importance and authority, might have decided the appeal, but he was given to understand by the emperor that it was an affair beyond his jurisdiction, and he submitted to the necessity of non-interference and left the emperor to have his own way, even upon this ecclesiastical matter, if so much importance as the appointment of a bishop over the Alexandrian Christians. At the commencement of the pontificate of Felix II, this expelled bishop was at Rome, and so played upon the prejudices of the Pope against Constantinople as to induce him to send legates to the emperor to protest against the protection given to heretics there. These legates, being engaged in what Zeno considered an insolent mission, were arrested by his orders, thrown into prison, and threatened with death. But they had an equal appreciation with the Pope of the advantages of being on the strong side, and obtained their freedom by recognizing as the legitimate uh, recognizing as the legitimate bishop of Alexandria the heretic against whom P uh, Pope Felix had protested. When they returned to Rome, they were deposed and excommunicated. Failing then to bring the patriarch of Constantinople over to his side, 
Pope Felix issued the bull of excommunication against him and addressed to the emperor the letter mentioned by Archbishop Kenrick complaining of the treatment of his legates. All this was done by virtue of his spiritual authority alone. But even in that aspect of it, nothing was accomplished by it, for all his pretensions were treated with scorn by the emperor with whom he had no inclination to come into direct collision. Although he had much to be proud of and exercised plenary powers in all the ecclesiastical affairs at Rome, whenever he came in conflict with the emperor, even in reference to the domestic affairs of that city, he was reduced to the condition of a subject and laid no claim to any temporal power whatever. And thus it is certain that at the close of the pontificate of Felix II in the year 492, the Pope of Rome neither had nor claimed to have any temporal power as a part of the patrimony of Peter, or derived it in any other way. He was a mere bishop, like the Bishop of Alexandria, Corinth, and other places, and his powers were limited to the administration of spiritual affairs. In temporal matters, he was as much a subject to the emperor as, and the laws of the empire as any of the inferior clergy or the people. The struggle, the struggle however, for the acquisition of temporal power went on all the time, with results varying according to the circumstances. The strong popes gained upon the weak emperors, but when the latter were courageous enough to assert and maintain their authority, the, the authority of the empire, the papacy was dwarfed into the narrowest proportions. The church, in the meantime, was left to drift along into whatever currents the, the interest and ambition of the contending factions carried it and the cause of genuine Christianity was made subordinate to political rivalries and would have expired if God had not preserved, even in Rome, faithful guardians to shelter and preserve it. Again, this author presumes that there was something godly at one time about the Roman Catholic Church. But we've all been deceived about Rome in one manner or another, and myself included. Thank God that he has opened the doors of my understanding to what the Roman Catholic Church is really all about. Continuing, he says, The century which elapsed between the pontificate of Felix II and that of Gregory I, embracing the reigns of fifteen popes, contributed but little toward conferring temporal power upon the Bishop of Rome. The emperors continued to maintain their ascendancy, although the angry controversies between the Eastern and Western Christians kept up a perpetual strife between Rome and Constantinople, in which some of the popes proved themselves the superiors of the emperors in the management of public affairs. There was no relaxation of their efforts to consummate the policy of Pope Leo I, by, by bringing all the existing governments into subjection to the papacy. Let me read that again. There was no relaxation of their efforts to consummate the policy of Pope Leo I by bringing all the existing governments into subjection to the papacy. This proves that it has been the, the very origin of the Roman Church to bring all nations into subjection to the Pope. Pope Leo the Great, one of the earliest popes of the Roman Catholic Church, sought to bring all governments to his feet. And that ambition has never ceased. And it is the New World Order. Thanks for listening. We've wrapped up the week. I'll see you Monday on Inquisition Update.